Greetings, my name is Philip Daniel Miles and today I'm very excited to be here on Nadia Shah's YouTube channel. What an absolute pleasure and a privilege, a pure honour to be able to share this brilliant experience with you. Today I'm going to be presenting a technique with regards to the secondary progress chart in astrology. This is one of my favorite techniques because it is both incredibly technical but also beautiful. It's actually very therapeutic to use in consultations because it allows us to check back at our experiences through the course of the wholeness of time. And this gains us a really great perspective of what we may have been through over our lifetime so far. So when we're looking at future transits over the time that we're moving into, we're able to come from a centered space of knowing ourselves and have done some real serious healing work. So we don't repeat the same cycles over and over again. And we can have greater empathy and compassion for all that we have already been through. So, Allow me to just tell you a little bit about myself. I am an astrologer. I've been working full time as an astrologer for two years, maybe a little bit more than that now. And I first started studying astrology maybe in about 2007. Uh, very relaxed. It was just a hobby, you know. Just on a spiritual quest and you know watching YouTube videos picking up information here and there and it was actually in 2011 I saw a great astrologer Kay Patcher interviewed by somebody who was very inspirational to me Lilu Mace two very inspirational figures and his advice was to become your own astrologer so I advise that to everybody yeah obviously we have to learn how this works. We have to learn about all of the different contexts and so it's really beneficial to learn from a variety of different people so that we can look at the buffet of different teachings and the academics of it all as well as the experience of learning astrology and living through cycles. And so I firstly was learning through books and through other YouTube astrologers and I acquired a wealth of information, very practical it was too. Not only that, in 2014 I joined a, a local astrology group, a circle of astrologers who have been very academically acclaimed, who've been studying for decades. And so they'd have a speaker every couple of weeks who would present a different technique or a different talk on various different subjects within the astrological field. And so it was very valuable for me to connect to people in person and to diagnose all of their different teachings and process what was most beneficial for my personal work. And so through that practice, through those experiences, I'd end up sharing and I'd end up receiving compliments on actually how good I was at sharing my own perspective on astrology. And so I was encouraged to move forward and to hold consultations myself. And so I since was holding space for people, uh, listening to people, uh, because I was like, oh, I'm not qualified, I don't really know what to do. Uh, I was just being really humble, actually, because I had acquired such a lot of information, and sometimes it just fits like an old pair of shoes. However, I offered consultations where I could hold space and simply listen to people without having to provide advice. That way, I could get a kind of feel for what it was like to be able to be in the process of holding a consultation with other people. My mother was, has been a therapist for 25, almost 30 years now. She actually it teaches the lecturers how to lecture about therapy, psychology, psychotherapy. And so this is incredibly beneficial for me. Um, I grew up with the books all around me and her having conversations with her colleagues and such and such. So I was very familiar with a lot of the techniques and processes because I pick up the books and flip through the books and have a little read here and there. And so I learned a lot about shadow work. I learned a lot about Jung and Freud and many, 
many of the techniques was second nature to me, in a sense. However, academics wasn't really my path. I wasn't really celebrated at school. I'm a bit of an alternative chap. I actually have Chiron opposed Saturn in my chart and a T-square with Jupiter and Mars. So I like to go in my own way a little bit. Not only that, but I've got Mercury conjunct Uranus in the same degree in my third house. So I'm a bit of a rebellious, against the grain, kind of eccentric and electrifying kind of astrologer. But I allow that to come through my work and I bring forth very great enthusiasm with regards to how I connect to a higher source. I connect to something which is slightly profound and beyond our times. And so this is very pioneering and exciting for me. And yet I have Saturn also in the same house, in Sagittarius, in the third house. So I do like to use the traditional roots as well to give me form and construct to that which I share. And so it was actually, as I say, since 2017 that I've been working full time as a professional astrologer. I was working with the Astro Larder team, which is a really great opportunity that I'm incredibly grateful for. And it's actually the past year that I have veered off on my own path, uh, working as my own brand at unifyingperspectives.net, where you can reach me if you would like a personal consultation. All of the links for how you can reach me and connect with my services, including my YouTube channel, which I started way back in 2011 as a personal blog, as well as sharing my own philosophical points of view and teachings, if you will, as well as poetry and weekly uh, astrological reports. Just really, whenever I'm inspired, I'm always uploaded most days, to be honest. So subscribe if you feel guided to, if you resonate with what I have to share. And I'm very happy to connect with you and share at any time. Anyway. Thank you very much, Nadia, for this opportunity to be present. I actually, on my YouTube channel, have interviewed Nadia Shah, as well as about 60 so far, getting on for 70, always interviewing great astrologers and spiritual teachers. So check out the playlist there. There's a great wealth of content. I've interviewed such astrologers as Lada Junchiva, The Leo King, uh, also Alyssa Trahan, and Santos Bonacci, just to name a few. Oh, Timothy Halloran, great people. And so, yeah, check out my playlist. I'm very proud of what I do. And it's a great opportunity for me to connect with some of the best people in our field. And so, thank you so much for your moments, for me explaining a little about me. And again, thank you, Nadia, for this opportunity to share one of my favourite and inspirational techniques. So, what is this secondary progressed chart? How does it work? Well, it works quite deep. It's quite a complicated subject, so I appreciate your patience and time while I explain. This works like through cognitive nature. It's actually a very progressive technique, as it says on the tin. And so if we know anything about the Fibonacci spiral, Fibonacci ratio, it's uh, the golden ratio, one plus one, equals two, two plus one equals three, three plus two equals five, five plus three equals eight, etc., etc. following the pattern where you add the number to the previous number and then you get the result of the next. And then that actually is how you get a spiral. This is actually the Venetian dance that Venus makes over the course of eight years through her cycle. You can also see this in Saturn's cycle as well. The nature of astrology is truly beautiful. And so, this is how I believe and how I would share that actually, the nine months that we have in our mother's womb is actually uh, picking up all of the energies that we are actually gonna experience in our lives. Uh, and we plot ourselves in to when we're born. And it's the moment of our first breath that our chart is cast, our nativity chart, our natal chart. And that includes all of the play, all of the drama, all of the eventualities, the best day of our life and the worst day of our life. All the light and all the dark, all the negative and all the positive. And we need negative. We need positive. This is just masculine and feminine energy at the end of the day. And there's light in the dark and there's dark in the light. 
And so we weave between these polarities and we find our power at the centaur of it all. Because if we look at the Sagittarius archetype, which is a centaur, just like Chiron, half beast, half God, if you will. And so that's the source. We are half flesh, suit, uh, and we're half spiritual nature. And our flesh suit's made mostly of water and clay, the earth. And so they are the feminine elements, earth and water. And they're very receptive. And yet the masculine energy of the spirit, which is the fire, and the air, which is the, the intelligence, uh, are the masculine elements. So the masculine is electric and the feminine is magnetic. And these two create a toroidal field, which is like an atom, which is each one of our cells. And these cells come together, we've got trillions of them. They make these beautiful bodies that we inhabit and they build the whole of our environment. The ancients would know and speak of this as the Maya, or the illusion. And so this is very much the Virgo polarity with Pisces polarity. And so Earth is an anagram of the word heart. We're living on the surface of the Earth, if you will. You could say it's like the Garden of Eden. And yet, when we see you up, out of our eyes, all is an illusion. And yet the healing journey often happens from what we see out here in our experience in the physical. And then we go and process it when we go into meditation and we go within ourselves. And OM centers us from the masculine side and the feminine side, the left and the right hand side of our hemispheres of our brain. And this brings us into our centered nature, brings us into presence. It brings us into our third eye, which is our pituitary gland, at the center of our brains. The superior brachium, actually, is what is a pitchfork in the middle of our brains, and it brings us into this ability to channel the masculine energy from this feminine construct of the human body. And so that's the template or the temple that we're working with. Every atom is like a zodiac, a zoo of archetypes. And a zoo of archetypes is the Aries all the way through to Pisces. And so this is just like every day. We rise with Aries at six in the morning when the sun dawns. Obviously, it's not always at six in the morning, but at the equinox point, this is the, the template. And then at midday, we have cancer, and that's when the sun's at the top of the sky. And then by the evening, we're in Libra. These are the cardinal points. Libra is where things even out, and the sun sets, if you will. It goes further away from the horizon that we can't even see it. We're not in the light. We're in the darkness. And so that's uh, equilibrium, evening out. The evening's here. And then we have our dark, and... It's our night time, and by midnight, where the sun is farthest from us, and we can't see it, it is Capricorn time. Not so long from now, six hours later, you know, it's going to be time for the sun to return to us. And that is Aries time again. That's the whole sine wave. It's like the yin and the yang. If you get this circle of a chart that's behind me, it's just like, this is Aries, that's Cancer, this is Libra, this is Capricorn. But if you was to break this into two circles, we have the sine wave, and it's an S, okay? And so that is the nature of a zodiac, and that is the nature of our atoms. They're all caught in a spin, the toroidal field. And so we're living on the earth, on the outside of the earth, just like on the outside of our bodies is our waking life, our waking dream. And yet, when we go into meditation, when we come into the presence of ourselves, uh, in our own ambiance, if you will, um, then we're going within. And so within ourselves, within our cells, we've got the consciousness. And so that is the nature of being an electromagnetic being. That's the science of astrology. It's about electromagnetics.
and our breath brings us into that center or the center of our being and that's when we gain our presence and so it's that first breath that we take when we're born when we come out of the womb and we're here in the world the big wide world <laughs> and so we can't head first like Aries right but it is as we live through our lives the first 30 days of our lives will be the first 30 years of our lives projected in the secondary progress chart and so the first 90 days would be that first 90 years of our lives if we lived to 90 years old so the sun in the secondary progress chart moves forward one degree per year this means if you were born with the sun at zero degrees of Aries, by the time that you're 10 years old, your sun progresses to 10 degrees of Aries. By the time that we're 30 years old, if you were born with the sun at zero degrees of Aries, it would actually progress into the sign of Taurus. And in the progress chart, you'd be a Taurus sun. And so we can see our personal evolution over the course of time. And this is about our personal development. Not only that, but the moon is like the first satellite that we see. It's the nearest one that we can see with our naked eye. We have 28 days, we have a lunar cycle, right? And so the moon moves one degree per moon, one degree per month, or thereabouts. And so over the course of 12 months, the moon would have moved 12 degrees forward in the zodiac. This means that over the course of 28 years, which is a Saturn cycle, we would have had the moon move around all 360 degrees of the chart. It's actually 364 degrees. So it would have actually surpassed it over the course of a Saturn cycle. So this gains us so much knowledge because as the moon is moving through different signs, different houses, transiting different planets with regards to the progress chart, we can see how we are developing as a being and how our experiences are rippling out. And so this is very complicated, as you can already tell. But when we share my um, chart in a moment, when I share my screen, I've got some examples about how this works. And so this is really beneficial not just for projecting into the future thinking well, what's going to happen in a few years eh? what's going to happen well limitless potential is that we are co-creators we are at the center of our experience so we're not a victim we're victorious with regards to how we create this experience when we're working with the energy when we make the planets our friends like saturn our friends when we do our due diligence and we live within our integrity and we take care of our vessels, we take care of these bodies, we take care of that which we build through the cycles of time. Each month we have an opportunity to build something with regards to our own conception as well as release something, some of the stagnant energy, some of the emotional energy, that energy in motion that maybe we have held on to in our cells, in our cellular memory. And so this is uh, like Rahu and Ketu, the nodes. Rahu is all about that physical. I'm going to go and get this. I'm going to possess that. I'm going to go after this. And it's insatiable. It's like a, it's a dragon without a head. Uh, well, excuse me. It's a head of a dragon without a body. <laughs> and so it can just eat as much as it wants. Gobble, 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 gobble. And yet the tail of the dragon, Ketu, it is about releasing and it stores things up it stores things up it accumulates it accumulates and it has a lot of wisdom in it also a lot of spiritual wisdom but it's also about processing letting go it's a bit like how in the new moon we start something new and in the full moon we release something and so that again is very powerful for our knowledge about cycles so i will explain about this just before i share my screen with the examples of the progress chart so in the 360 degrees of a circle, we would have a new moon, say, for instance, at zero degrees of Aries. And then by the time we've had a week into the lunar cycle, the moon would have moved to Cancer. 
the moon is the same. And it would be 90 degrees from where it started. And so that's seven days. And after one week, we are setting out on to act. It's a great time to act. If we're going to plant seeds for a project, literally, if we're going to plant seeds in the garden, it's a great time to act. And even if you're going to get a haircut, it's a really beneficial time to act because you know it's going to grow thicker. It's going to grow with the moon. And so that can be incredibly beneficial, especially as our hair is like an antennae for our crown chakra. So it's specifically good to work with these energies. Whereas if we're releasing something, we do that on the full moon, which is 180 degrees, two weeks into the lunar cycle. We're like, oh, I've been building something. I've been acting towards something. I've got a, uh, something that I've been mastering in this cycle, a conception. And I am now able to release something that has been cluttering up my space. And so we release something with regards to the accordance of whichever sign that we're working with. For instance, 180 degrees from where it started at zero degrees of Aries, it would be at the beginning of Libra. And so that would be the energy that we're working with. And so three weeks into a lunar cycle, which is 270 degrees of a circle, we'll be looking at being more conscious of that which we are working with. The moon will be in the sign of Capricorn and we'll be truly building something. We'll be like building an empire. We'll be really moving to our own standards and aspirations. We'll be like thinking about what, we are working towards in the world, how we're seen in the world. And we're becoming much more conscious of that which we've been acting upon over the course of the past three weeks. And so this is incredibly valuable. And then the moon waning still, we're able to release, 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 as we're more conscious of that energy that we're working with. Then we're building towards another new moon in the sign of Taurus this time. Okay, so that's just a little bit of an explanation, but this is very powerful because over the 28 years just like the 28 days Saturn does the same so it would take Saturn seven years to move through a quarter 90 degrees of the chart and it would be 14 years which is 180 degrees of the chart and so the same dynamic works we're acting seven years into the chart we're releasing 14 years into a Saturn cycle and then after 21 years, we're like much more conscious. We're releasing and releasing. We're like, hey, I'm making space for things that I might build in my next Saturn cycle. And then we're having our Saturn return eventually by the time it comes into the same position as it was when we were born. And so this is very much like the lunar cycle. And we can learn so much because all cycles are working with this same template. And so this is very beneficial for our knowledge of astrology it's all circles it's all cycles it's all cogs within our cognitive nature and see so we see this reflected in our sky outwardly and we experience it inwardly also and so we do the dance as the center as the silver lining between all things we are the alchemist the astrologer the magician and the theologian when we bring together all this knowledge we are really coming into our own power and so this is the practice that I work with and I implore and encourage everybody else to do so also. And so one more example before I share my screen. And that is if you're having a solar return, which is our birthday, it's just like a new moon. It's just like a Saturn cycle. And so each of these could be considered a winter in our experience. Like a Saturn return could be a time where we come into more rest, like a new moon, we're, we're taking a bit of rest uh, and so that we can actually work with the more subtle energies and we can see that we're going to be working on a new conception, a new thing that we're building and working towards. And so maybe we won't even know what we're going to build. We don't know what this conception is because we've not gone into the action. We're not 90 degrees into the cycle yet. But yet we know it's that time. So we honour the cycles. We honour the winter. And it's that 90 degrees in, which we can consider a spring. And so we're springing into action. We're going head first into things. We're like, oh, I'm going to try my hand at this. I'm going to try my hand at that. We might exactly know what we're trying our hand in. 
with accordance to where these energies fall into our natal chart. And so it's very beneficial to be able to know what's going on in our play, in our nativity, with accordance to all of these cycles, so that we can work with these energies and make the most, create the most out of the limitless potential within our heart's eye. And so this is incredibly powerful, right? Mm -hmm. And so with a solar cycle, when we're getting into the spring, we're like, oh, we're moving into the action, we're building things that are incredibly inspirational for our hearts. And when we're six months into the year and we're six months away from the next birthday, the next solar return, we have expanded so much. We can be like, wow, I didn't know I was going to be creating this. And then we can really reflect back upon on our birthday. And think, well, I've come so far. And we can be proud of ourselves, of what we have created. And also, we were able to release some things uh, so that we were able to broaden our perspective about what we may be able to become more conscious of over the course of the next 90 days. By the time we've had 270 or so days into our solar cycle, our own solar year, we're becoming so much more conscious of that which we're working with. Okay? That's a lot of information, but that is a template that we work with with all cycles. Just a circle, and it's all the degrees of a circle. It's very powerful information, right? And yet it's the construct of astrology. And so through the whole arc of the circle, through the whole arc of 360 angles, we gain so much more presence. It's a bit like an omnipresence. Om. <laughs> and that's like when we go between the physical waking illusion and we go into our own spiritual experience. We bounce between the two. And this is what allows us to be that silver lining, the yin and the yang. And that is true empowerment as we come into our wholeness as a person. And a person is just a star, just like a prick of light within the whole dark sky. We are a peephole for the divine. And so I'm going to use a couple of peoples to share as examples for the secondary progress chart. And I'm going to share my screen. The first of which is entrepreneur Richard Branson. You may be familiar. Uh, he actually has worked with building his own brand, uh, Virgin. Uh, he actually built Virgin Records, uh, also had an airline, he had a radio station. I'm going to walk us through some of his experiences with regards to this chart and share how this works. Also, Jim Carrey, the actor uh, and the comedian, I'm going to share how this plays out and how we can see the very synonymous and on point synchronicities or manifestations as they ripple out through the wholeness of time. And it is knowing what's happened in our past that allows us to know what we're able to create or what possibilities we're able to work with moving forward into the future. Now, let me share my screen. Thank you for sticking with me. I really appreciate you being present for this explanation. So, here is Richard Branson's nativity, his natal chart. He was born in 1950 with the sun at 25 degrees of Cancer in the 12th house, also in the 12th house of Uranus. And so his moon is at one degree of Virgo. And so he very much values his emotions, seeing all the details in the emotions. He's very much a creative witnesser from the tops down, a bird's eye perspective this Branson has. And this is what makes him so valuable, so credible. He's not just able to take the spiritual observational stance at witnessing how he's able to draw from his masculine energies and make them into a very credible uh, source for his inspiration in this world because he is Saturn in, in the second house also, giving form to that which he creates with his emotional awareness with his observing eye. His ascendant is Leo at 14 degrees, conjunct Pluto at 17 degrees of Leo. That's a very powerful combination. 
Pluto ruling Scorpio, which is his fourth house of the home, and also the eighth house. And the eighth house, he has Jupiter retrograde at six degrees. And so Jupiter rules Pisces, which falls into his eighth house. And so it's at home there in the ancient astrology. And also Jupiter rules Sagittarius, which rules his fifth house. So it's very powerful that he's able to be creative with his standpoint of witnessing a very empathic and compassionate witness for how he does business with other people. His philosophy on business and working with different people and different energies is very much about his healing path because he has Chiron in the fifth house. And so that's uh, allowing him to access how he is healing as a entrepreneur, as a oligarch, if you will, uh, as a um, person who is able to share his business ideas and lead as a pioneer with great enthusiasm uh, on an international level. He has his MC in this natal chart in Aries with Rahu, his north node. It's zero degrees of Aries. And uh, Mars rules this MC, Mars rules Aries. Mars actually falls into his third house at 16 degrees conjunct Neptune. And so, again, Neptune rule in the modern uh, astrology rules Pisces, it rules the 12th house. So he's able to establish great bird's eye view perspective on his creative ability to share and trade ideas in a very assertive way this is his identity to be able to be compassionate in balance see himself through the eyes of others that he's working with and bring a whole wealth of experience at how to see other people's points of view and perspective through his own eyes also and so this conjunction of neptune and mars both sextile chiron in his fifth house and his ascendant and pluto in his first house um, which actually his first house conjunction of Pluto and the Ascendant Shrine Chiron also. We've got this lovely little triangle here. And so these energies are very flowing. They work with each other in a very beneficial way. Um, sometimes you can see that sometimes his assertiveness causes the gentleman to work with his own healing path, as well as savour his opportunity to help others reach to their goals and reach their empowerment also. So he's building a bridge between his intuition and his ability to vocalise his own sense of identity and his own uh, passion for bringing something physical into this world where he's had it just conjure up as an inspired thought originally. Also, he has Venus in the 11th house of social networks and spheres of influence. Uh, and so he's very um, valuable with regards to these abilities to connect with other people he's very receptive to other people's ideas and perspectives and this is where he is able to be such a, a, a gift and learn so much as well within his experiences mercury the ruler of his third house the ruler of his second house the ruler of his 11th house was mercury was virgo and gemini and it's actually the third house it's in his first house here in leo i'm using whole house equal signs by the way this is the way uh, of the uh, Hellenistic tradition, which is one of the roots of astrology. And so this is the way that I operate in all of my consultations. And I find it's very beneficial for my readings, especially with transit work and this technique specifically. And I do respect all, how, all the, the other different ways of working with the house the houses. Um, Porphyry is a very good one. And Placidus. Uh, however, this is the one that I use and find works very, very powerfully. Uh, and so this is the one I use. Anyway, Mercury in the third house, I mean, in the first house, means obviously this gentleman is a very powerful communicator and uses his inspiration and his heart and his philosophy and his ability to listen and witness very empathically with his emotions uh, and make these connections in a very valuable and creative way. And so that's all of the chart brought together for you in a quick whippersnapper manner. Um, obviously, you could spend hours talking about a natal chart because it is the root. It always shall be. It's very powerful to know our natal charts. Uh, and obviously, uh, that is 
how we work with all of our energies, the best day of our lives, the worst day of our lives. This is the archetype of us. However, this is the secondary progress chart technique I'm here to share. And so as I say, the sun moves one degree per year, whereas the moon moves one degree per month. And there's actually 13 lunar cycles in a year. And so as I see, as I move this moon forward 13 months, you'll see the sun move one degree. Just as an experiment, I'll be sharing this with you now. Keep your eye on the moon. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. It started at the first degree of Virgo, now it's at 14 degrees of Virgo, and the sun moved to 26 degrees of Cancer. The other planets do move forward in the secondary progress chart at varying rates. You can see that Mercury's already moved two degrees. It started out at three degrees of Leo, now it's at five degrees. Whereas Pluto is much more slow moving. His ascendant has also moved one degree. And so eventually the ascendant does shift, which means that all of the energies, the signs, shift into different houses if once the ascendant progresses into another sign. So this is very complex, very powerful. And so the outer planets move much more slowly and the more personal, faster moving planets move at a faster rate but no more fast than the moon. Because the moon is the one that is our nearest satellite to us. Pluto being the farthest, or traditionally Saturn, the farthest from us. And so, let me continue to work with this whole dynamic. I'm actually going to start moving it by years. And because I have a couple of bullet points with regards to Richard Branson's career, uh, and I'm not going to work with his personal life. I don't know the gentleman's personal life. I'm just going to work with these bullet points as my examples. And so it was actually when Richard was 16 in 1966 that he launched his first successful business, which was a magazine called Student. And in this magazine, it was like a trendy magazine about culture. And so if I move this to 1966, this chart, we can see that moon like a ripper snapper rocketing through the jar. You can see also it was when in Richard was just six years old that the sun had progressed into his first house of Leo. The sun loves to be in Leo. It is the sign that is in correspondence with the sun. And so we also see at that time that the ascendant was conjunct Pluto. Very powerful stuff. It actually moved over Pluto. Mercury is coming into a conjunction with Pluto also. I don't know what was going on for Richard at this time, but obviously very powerful stuff. So by the time we get to 1966, when Richard started his magazine, Student, we see that the progressed moon had moved all the way around the chart. It would have been a couple of years prior when the full moon would have happened in 1963, which is what, 13, 14 years old. We have the first full moon in the progress chart because that's our Saturn opposition. Saturn by transit would have been opposite where it started. So Saturn would have been in Pisces at this time by transit. So this is very powerful for us to be aware of. And so I'm just going to continue to back to 66 when Richard made his, his, his um, first pioneering business move, starting his magazine called Student. We see here that the moon was in Aries, and so in the ninth house of international uh, teachings and uh, philosophy and all of this. His nodes have shifted as well. They started in the polarity of Aries and Libra, and now they've shifted into Pisces and Virgo. Very interesting part of the story because the nodes have shifted from the third house and the ninth house, where they are in the natal chart, into the second house and into the eighth house of value and trade. Um, not just trade like how you trade in the third house, but actual business negotiation, shared energy of the eighth house. That's very powerful indeed. However, the moon is nurturing Richard's identity uh, in this ninth house. He's able to do something that he identifies with 
Mars ruled in that night, but you can see it's moved to 25 degrees. It started at 17 degrees. And the Mercury, the ruler of the third, if you will, is actually in its home sign of Virgo now in the progress chart in the same degree where his moon was. So his communications, his media, Virgo, which is media, Mercury, which is the communications, is nurturing to him as he's broadening his perspective, which is the ninth house, of his own identifications, which is Mars, is Aries. So that's very cool that you can see that in this chart. It was two years later in 1968 where Richard would actually interview Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones in his magazine. And the moon had progressed into Taurus, which is all about value, sensuality, doing things that give us credit. And in the 10th house, it's about aspiring to our own peaks of our own mountain. It's the top of his chart where the secondary progress moon is. And you can see it's making a 120, well, 119 degree aspect to Mercury here. Obviously, the moon moving one degree per month, it would actually progress all over these degrees over the course of that year in 1968. So that trine would be going on around the time of his interview to Mick Jagger. And the MC has also progressed into the 10th house here. And so this is a very big move, a very powerful move for this Saturnian 10th house. And so that's great stuff. And um, we see also that the sun is coming into closer and closer conjunction with Pluto and the ascendant is actually coming to the end of Leo as well. So we keep an eye on these things, these dynamics. Venus has moved from where it was in the 11th house to Cancer. Really worth checking back. There's so much to keep an eye on. Actually, it was around just before the full moon uh, when the moon would have trined its natal position that, mo that Venus would conjunct Uranus. Obviously, that would have been when Richard was 10 years old. We don't really know what was going on then. But in a normal consultation, we take reference of all these points. And I would ask, hey, what was going on for you when you were 10 years old? And someone might say, oh, that's when I joined this community. Or that's when I did this or that. If Venus was conjunct Uranus. And so this is very interesting for us all to know about. And so this is where the healing happens, especially if, for instance, we're like, oh, I didn't realize that's when this was going on. Oh, I have much more compassion for my experience now, much more empathy for what's been going on. I can understand my, my life so much more now I see this through these transits uh, of the secondary progress chart. And obviously you can then apply the actual transits that were being made to the natal chart. And you've got multiple layers about how we can perceive what's gone on through our experience. And we can actually put things to rest. We can do a lot of letting go through this therapeutic technique. It was in 1971, a couple of years later, that Richard would start a record shop in Oxford Street in London. And that's a very high-flying place to have a shop indeed, especially a record shop. Very cool, very exciting. <laughs> and so the moon has progressed into... Gemini here in the 11th house and that's great stuff because it's about social networks it's about being able to be able to connect with other people that you share things in common with and so he was actually sharing within the music industry which is about media production and trade Mercury ruled in Gemini Mercury in Virgo very powerful kind of moves that have been going on there especially with that sun getting closer and closer to Pluto. It was a year later, the moon's still in Gemini, and that sun one degree away from Pluto. And Mercury coming into a conjunction in the progress chart of Saturn also, very slowly, but still quite pacely. <laughs> and we see Mars also at the 29th degree of Libra in that third house, soon to move into the fourth house. But at the same time, with the ascendant at 29 degrees of Leo, Mars isn't really going to do much in the fourth house because all of the signs are about to shift as the ascendant shifts into Virgo. Very powerful stuff. And so 
It was in 1972 that Virgin Records become a thing. It wasn't just a record shop. He started his record label. And this record label would last from 1972 to 1980. He would hire such bands early on as the Sex Pistols, the very famous punk band, and also the Rolling Stones themselves, Mick Jagger's band. So we can see that it was just a few years earlier, back in 1968, that Richard would interview Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones for his magazine student. And in 19... In the 1970s, uh, he had actually signed the band. That's amazing, right? For a 23-year-old or someone who's in his early 20s to be able to sign one of their heroes' band, who he interviewed a few years earlier. I mean, I love doing my interviews as an astrologer. I get to interview a lot of my peers, and I gaze across at these heroes in the astrological field, like Nadia Shah. Check out the interview on my channel, as I say so many other interviews I've done. It's a great inspiration to be able to do that. So I can certainly uh, have uh, a shared experience of Richard there and say how exciting that must be. He also uh, signed UB40, the famous reggae act, amongst other bands, to his record label, Virgin Records. So that's very interesting indeed. And it was by 19... 79, although in 1974, you can see this is when the, well, this all powerful maneuvers going on, it was in 1973, the sun made its conjunction with Pluto, uh, in, and the moon has slipped into the 12th house, making a conjunction with Uranus, and so then that was very big for him, he was accumulating a lot of wealth, it would seem, uh, especially with Mercury coming into that conjunction with Saturn as well. And so this could have been quite shocking for Richard, the progression that he was making in his life. And so the Ascendant had shifted. The Ascendant shifts into Virgo. With, that means his descendant was conjunct retrograde Jupiter, which was retrogressing ever so slowly, ever so slightly uh, in Pisces, which was his eighth house in the natal chart, and is now his seventh house. So a completely different dynamic for the entire chart. It should be known for a man of great communications, great structure, very fine eye for detail, and yet also for working with people in an international field, uh, as an international businessman with great compassion. The sun now back in the 12th house, still conjunct Pluto, and the moon still progressing through Cancer, but that's now again his 11th house in a conjunction with Venus bringing in all that money. Beautiful stuff. It was actually uh, by 1979 that I also received Pisces, uh, Mars has slipped into Scorpio, its ancient ruling sign, back in the third house. Powerful business manoeuvres, shared energy, shared identifications within the business world, within his trade and exchange of other people. Mars shrining Jupiter, accumulating more sense of self and Mars ruling his eighth house now where, Ver where Aries rules, where Ver Aries is sat. So that's very powerful indeed. We can see we're building a great tapestry uh, of this whole story as it plays out. And so it was in 1979 that Richard's net worth as the moon uh, comes into the first house of Virgo, and we see that it's actually 1979, <laughs> uh, by the time the moon has transited over Saturn and Mercury has made that conjunction with Saturn in Virgo, that Richard's net worth had reached five million pounds. That was so much money in the late 70s, that's like being a billionaire now. <laughs> uh, and so we can see that Richard was well on his way to becoming one of the most powerful men in the world. The moon coming into a conjunction with Ketu, the south node, in the first house of Virgo, can always bring around unexpected events. I'm actually born with the moon conjunct Ketu in my first house. That's always a great opportunity to release. And we see Venus is actually just leaving the moon's sign, which falls into the 11th house, so going to be transiting 
in this progress chart into Leo. Uh, it's quite interesting to see that going on. He's actually coming into more wealth at this time, which he will obviously be having to release an old sense of identification, an old relationship stance, an old way of being, an old identification of who he was. It's coming through transformation, which is the sun with Pluto, very transformational kind of energy in that 12th house. So a lot of processing going on for Richard at this time as uh, a 30 year old man. And so the moon continues its journey. It's on its second loop now. He's had his Saturn return, but it was a bit of been a few years prior, Saturn when the moon returned to its same natal position back in 1978, would have been the same time that Richard had his Saturn return. Saturn would have returned back to the 14th degree of Virgo where it was in his natal chart. You see it's at 18 degrees here, which is when Mercury made its conjunction with Saturn in the secondary progress chart at the same time of the return. This is really all of the wealth coming together, all of his hard work through these 28 years. 28 years can be seen as the same as the first seven years, seen as the same as the first di uh, the, the nine months spent in the womb of the, of the mother as well. This is that Fibonacci golden ratio that I was talking about. Fibonacci being the fib of no chi. <laughs> it can make you breathless. Some of these kind of synchronicities as they ripple out through the wholeness of time. And so it was in 1981 that uh, Richard would invest in a very risky business move. And we see that there's a grand water trine here with Mars, Jupiter retrograde and Uranus. People would have been quite shocked that Richard set out on this business venture to be able to bring together international holiday packages in his business of Virgin Atlantic, with the MC being in uh, the ninth house of international affairs and this trine happening with Jupiter as well as Uranus and Mars, where Mars ruling the eighth house and Uranus ruling his uh, sixth house of, Ura of Aquarius, which is like the workplace and his day-to-day -day fixtures and fittings in his routines, we can see that this would have taken up a lot of time for him and been quite an investment. And who's to say if it was going to pay off or not? In fact, I know that it cost him a lot of money and would later ask him to consolidate some of the investments that he made. This wasn't actually one of his wisest manoeuvres. However, obviously, it was a passion project for the man. Mars being in the, the third house is a identification with wanting to bring the world together, make the world a smaller place through airline travel. Very powerful. <laughs> Mars, I mean, the sun still conjunct Pluto and Mars being in Pluto, um, in um, Scorpio, all of these maneuvers are very powerful indeed. So again, with Mercury conjunct Saturn, it's about bringing things together and uh, con contractions uh, can bring together things and bring a bit like a coal into a diamond. And so this is not going to stop Richard uh, from accumulating more wealth. And so it was actually that this business would last from 1981 to 1987. Very powerful indeed. And so we can continue this journey and we see that the moon continues going through these charts. 1987, uh, it's in the fifth house and the moon will make trying to all of the energy in the first house where the sun has now progressed into Virgo. Started at 25 degrees of Cancer, it's gone all the way through Leo, and now it's in Virgo. And the ascendant, as I say, still in Virgo, making its way through Mercury, conjuncts the south node here in 1987. And so we can see that business come to a halt. As I say, the, the holiday packages, Virgin Atlantic, came to a halt when Mercury, which is about trade and exchange, conjunct K to the South node, about releasing and letting go. In 1992, it, uh, we actually see that Richard would sell his beloved Virgin Records and Mercury has ingressed into Libra, still in a conjunction here with the K to the South node and the Moon being on Rahu, the North node in Pisces. And so when 
that uh, Richard would sell his original business, one of his original business of Virgin Records, to EMI for five hundred million pounds. That is bags of money. It's loads of money. <laughs> and so, what a move, eh? He certainly made up for any scenarios that, that or losses with regards to Virgin Atlantic with by selling his beloved record uh, company, Virgin Records, to EMI. He actually shed a tear. He wept. It was said he was very sad about that, very emotional with Moon being on Rahu at this time. And so it was quite shocking for, for his own sense of identity, his own business moves, Mars still being in a, a trine to Uranus as well. Venus here next to Pluto, we can see these dynamics playing out, right? Transformation of his own value, his own Venus ruling here, the, um, the second house where, where, of, of Libra, where Mercury is at, ingressed to. Oh, it's beautiful. I love a bit of astrology. <laughs> um, also Venus ruled in that ninth house, but we see the MC has transited back into the 10th house and is in Mercury's sign here in Gemini. So that's really interesting to know. In 1993, we see that Richard would invest in Virgin Trains, another risky move. <laughs> and uh, again, the moon is now in Mars's sign, which is just going out on a limb. It's asserting oneself. And it, so he was making these pioneering kind of maneuvers Moon, uh, Uranus being in the moon sign and Mars being in Scorpio ruling the eighth house. Very powerful scenarios going on, very powerful business deals. And so we see that the ascendants coming into a conjunction with Saturn also at this time. It was actually in 1996 that the Richard would invest in V2, which is another record company, like Virgin Records 2. He would only take 5% of this company because it's more of a passion project, close to his heart. And we can see this is about his self-worth and the moon has gone into the ninth house here and would try his first house of identification, would have tried his son, would have tried his ascendant. And it's really given a sense of emotional identification and structure to who he was by being able to invest in something that was obviously so close to his roots in the record industry, in the music industry. And so if we move forward to the year 2004, obviously, again, we can notice that that was a full moon. If we pay attention to the cycles of the circle that we started at, the cross, the crux of all things, the full moon with regards to his natal position would have been a few years prior when the moon was uh, in Pisces. Uh, and so we're seeing that this is about a waning lunar cycle with regards to his natal position of the moon. And it is actually whenever the sun and moon come together, I didn't actually highlight that uh, in this video, uh, this being the third time I've recorded this video due to Mercury retrograde scenarios, goodness me. Um, so yeah, great patience and due diligence for me <laughs> having to done this three times now. <laughs> Uh, but when we have a new moon in the chart, this is uh, obviously a new beginning. And very powerful it is too. And so we can see that whatever was going on in the new moon when he was a young lad, which would have happened, uh, happened when he was actually just before his Saturn return, uh, which is echoed back again as this transit comes into its closure in a few years from now. And so we got that moon shining the earth energy in his first house, but it was actually in 2004, if I move it forward, that Richard would invest in space tourism. Wow. I mean, I've never been to space. I don't know about space myself, but it's very pioneering and forwardly progressive, isn't it? Uh, it's something he must have thought about quite a lot. And we see the, um, the moon is actually in that 12th house conjunct Pluto. Very powerful you know, inspirational kind of move. Venus moved into that first house uh, of Virgo as well. And Mercury is retrograde in Libra. And Mercury rules the MC in Gemini. 
we all, if we lived to 90 years of age, would have 20 years of our lives with Mercury retrograde in the progress chart. So this is very interesting to know about. Mercury retrograde, obviously one of the, the planets that goes retrograde most frequently in our regular cycles, in our transits. And so this would be what happened so many years after, so many days after Richard's birth. This is actually just the sky, um, 54 days into Richard's birth. He was born in 1950. This is the year 2004. So that's 54 days after Richard's birth. This is what the chart would have been. And so it's almost two months uh, of Richard's life, right? And so you can see this powerful dynamic how it plays out in manifestation in the bigger, wider experience, but also within those first few days or of, of, of this man's life, you know, first couple of months. Very powerful, this technique. And so just coming to the end of this example now, in 2006, Richard sold Virgin, uh, Virgin Mobile, which is another business which he went into, for one billion pounds. Very powerful stuff. It was another new moon in his first house. Ascendant conjunct Saturn. Mercury's regressed back into Virgo, conjunct the south node again. And so Mercury was conjunct the south node while he sold uh, his record, record company and his mobile company. Exactly conjunct the south node when Mercury was retrograde. So this is very powerful to be aware of how we can see these dynamics playing out. And so this is what happened with Richard Branson. Okay. I think this is phenomenal, right? It's very phenomenal uh, how we can see this playing out through our lives, through the wholeness of time, through our experiences. And so I'm going to share next Jim Carrey. Just allow me to set that up for us. I appreciate your moments. I know this has been a long presentation, and yet this is a very technical procedure. I'm not making eye contact with the camera right now because I'm actually looking at my screen here. <laughs> I'll tell you a little about Jim while I do this. He was a Capricorn, born on 17th of January, 1962, and, He wasn't actually successful for quite a while. He had to do his due diligence on the underground circuit uh, in underground comedy circles. It wasn't recognized for his funny ways. And it was actually quite a lot later in life that he made his mark. It wasn't until he was in his, uh, in 1982, where he got his first job doing improv at an evening, at evening club. I think being a Capricorn, we often, grow up a little more slowly uh, and I'm a Capricorn myself uh, and so I can certainly empathize with Jim's path and he was actually taking care of relatives I can see that I'm glitching here a little bit because of the program I'm using and this is still Mercury retrograde so I appreciate you sticking with me through this presentation as I continue to share all of this information Let's just allow this to buff and come together. I'll take a breath. As I teach, this is how we come into the singularity of our presence. So, Jim Carrey, let me share my screen. Here we go. This is the natal chart for Jim Carrey. He had the moon conjunct his ascendant in Gemini. And you can see all of these planets up here in Aquarius. He's got Mercury, the ruler of his ascendant, conjunct his south node and conjunct Jupiter in Aquarius. Not only that, he had Saturn in Aquarius and his MC. He also has Mars and Venus in his eighth house in Capricorn, where also his son was at 27 degrees of Capricorn. 
And so he's very much a masculine and feminine kind of guy. He can do both masculine and feminine portrayals of characters within his own work, within his own comedy, and within his own personal life. Miles, being in the eighth house, his true identity is really never known. You know, he's always known for the roles that he played in his movies, but really, do we know the real Jim Carrey? We can see this very powerful T-square here with the nodes, and whenever you have anything in the natal chart squaring the nodes, it can be considered a missed step. And so this is something of an energy that we work with. And we see he has Neptune here as his missed step of the nodes. And so he's spent a lot of time in his day-to-day -day work working in emotional scenarios with the people that are nearest and dearest to him, his relationships with his nearest and dearest. And we know in more recent times, Jim worked with a bereavement of his wife uh, he was married to. And in the earlier days, I've heard stories that Jim would be, as I say, taking care of people uh, at home, uh, ill relatives. He would spend a lot of time taking care of, uh, I'm not sure if it was a grandmother or a mother or a father, but he had an ill relative that he lived with and he would spend a lot of time working and then he'd go and entertain them. And so he'd obviously learn his comedic ways through being great company to those people who were nearest and dearest to him. He has Uranus here in... Leo conjuncts the star Regulus. And so he's known for his wacky humour, his ambidextrous kind of craziness, his silly putty face. <laughs> Birdhouse, he pulled all kinds of silly faces. Very creative with that, his expression, right? Very eccentric being. And with all of that energy in Aquarius, Uranus ruling Aquarius, that's no surprise, really, is it? And so, very powerful, powerful man to be able to make people laugh it really takes a lot of intelligence not saying i know how to do that <laughs> anyway i'm making ourselves laugh can be half the journey a lot of the time especially when we've got the pressure on because we want to bring forward great content and yet we're dealing with mercury retrograde and kind of glitches and all these kinds of things all we can do is be transparent take off the mask and show up and do our best right Authenticity goes a long way. And so I appreciate you allowing me to be me through this experience. Well, I'm going to jump straight to the, to the point here. 1982, which is when Jim was 20 years old, he was working in comedy labs at an evening improv show. And that was his first comedy job. 1982, you see that the moon started in the first house. And by 1982, we would have imagined it would be three quarters of the way around the chart because 21 years into uh, our lives is when we are working with that energy. And so we can see that already that Jim's ascendant shifted into cancer in his early life. And that means it changed the dynamic of the whole entire chart. And we can see that he's got a grand water trine between his ascendant, Neptune, and his MC, which was conjunct the moon. So he's very emotional about working with his, uh, these energies, you know, in his philosophy on his emotions. And this brings up a great actor. So you can channel from your emotions. He has Chiron also uh, in Pisces. So he's able to work with his healing of his own journey when he's working with healing with other folks, when he's working with his own beliefs about his own emotion or identity. And so we can see everything shifted here. His communication is Got, he's got Pluto retrograde in Virgo. So he's able to see all of the different details of his soul, maybe, or other people's souls. And it means and when he's working with other people in mutual energy. So maybe when he's collaborating with others, he's able to bring into great power how he's able to bridge the gap between here and there. And we see that actually he's got this stellium of Mars, Saturn, Mercury now retrograde and the sun, which has progressed from Capricorn into Aquarius in a conjunction with K2, the south node, and Jupiter and Venus, all in the eighth house, all in Aquarius. My golly. So that's a lot of energy to contend with. And so he was a very powerful figure in underground networks. It was an underground comedy club in 1982. And yet this person wouldn't see the light of day and get famous until 1994. So let's move forward to that date. 
1994, we see that the moon has progressed all the way around the chart. It's having its Saturn return in 1989. And uh, we can see that the, the sun has moved from 27 degrees of Capricorn all the way through to it's getting on for 24 degrees of Aquarius there. So it's transited over Saturn, M Mercury, Mars, K2, self node, and Jupiter, and it's heading towards Venus. So anyway, by the time it gets to 1994, we see that the moon has gone through that first house again, and it's in the second house. The moon is in the second house, conjunct Rahu, the north node, and this year, it would have also conjuncted, made a conjunction with Uranus. On the south node, we still got this conjunction. It's actually the south node between Mars and Jupiter here. And the sun is at 29 degrees of Aquarius. One of the most unexpected, shocking degrees in the whole of the zodiac. Venus conjunct Chiron. Now, that is, and it's also his MC has progressed into Aries. So the man's like hidden identity within the community, his role within the community of his own uh, actor, acting energy, uh, the sun ruling actors and Leo ruling actors where the progressed moon is. The progressed moon opposite Jupiter uh, would have made opposition to the sun as well. And uh, well, a second joke to the known your access, the sun opposite uh, Uranus. Wow, shocking big pioneering leaps into the future. What happened in 1994, I hear you ask? Well, actually, it was the year that Jim would act in four of the biggest comedy movies of all time. Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, was the first. Also The Mask, and critically acclaimed, maybe one of the funniest movies of all time, I've heard it voted, Dumber or Dumb and Dumber all released in 1994. Wow, that's a massive leap forward. That's a massive accreditation for one person to be in all those movies in one year, let alone in a lifetime. And so he's gone from being unnoticed, unseen, unknown, to being one of the most famous men in the world, one of the funniest men in the world. But we don't know the real Jim. Also, Mercury has made its progression to being direct. As I say, we all have 20 years of Mercury retrograde if we live to 90 years. And so he wasn't born with Mercury retrograde, and yet he got it out of the way by the time of 1994. Um, so he's 30 something, and he's, he's managed to get that out of the way, and he would have learned so much by the integration of that retrograde phase. So if anybody's dealing with this in their own experience, we know actually not to be scared. We know it's not something to hold fear of because the success is always promised our own personal success is what we make for ourselves when we work with great energy when we work with our own hearts eye with our own inspiration and so wow ace ventura pet detective the mask and dumber dumber wow 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 that's all i can say about that amazing stuff <laughs> also we see that this energy of the moon and the sun and Jupiter was making this T-square, it's bringing alive this T-square to Neptune. It's also retrograde now. And so, great elusive kind of journey that uh, Jim was embarking on with regards to his own creativity. He, maybe he didn't know the fame that he'd be stepping into. Uh, starry, starry eyes, right? Okay, so a year later, the moon progressed into that second house, I mean that third house of Virgo, and making that conjunction with Pluto. And in 1995, it was that actually Jim would work as a role within uh, as Batman Forever. And he would also do Ace Ventura 2, Ace Ventura in Nature Calls. The sun progressed into Pisces. And so, again, a very elusive energy on an international stage now. Jim is very famous. Venus still in conjunction with Chiron, and now the Sun also there. There's a, there's a mini stellium, three planets within six degrees. It's very tight, as well as all that energy in this eighth house. I can't help but have compassion for this elevated journey of this great actor, this great magician, if you will, Jim Carrey. Wow. And so, Riddler, 
he would have been riddled to his core by this sudden progression in his experience, this sudden fame. And so we moved forward and it was just a year later that Jim would be in the cable guy. And um, maybe he was a member of the couple uh, because of his sudden fame, very powerful scenarios going on here, you know. Who's to say what's going on in this man's private life? And a year later, in 1997, Jim was in Liar Liar. And his pants weren't on fire, <laughs> but it's certainly his career was taking off like a rocket. The moon still progressed there in Virgo. Uh, and, um, you know, it was opposing. Originally, uh, when he was doing um, The Cable Guy, the moon would have opposed the sun. It would have opposed Kyle. It would have opposed Venus. So maybe his emotions weren't actually in alignment with what he was doing when he was working with Batman Forever and Jim um, and Ace Ventura too, and the Cable Guy. He was just doing it because he was on this roller coaster journey, and so he had found that he was a funny man and he was working with all these movies. He was given all these roles, and yet it was a little bit later that he found much more emotional uh, what films to work in, was like. Liar Liar was more of a family movie. And uh, it was in 1997. Uh, and so the moon has actually progressed into Libra by this time. We can see, if we move it by month, we can see that the moon opposing on his IC in 97 is in Libra here, uh, making trines to uh, the energy in his eighth house of Saturn and Mercury. So he's actually gaining more sense of identity, uh, more sense of self, of his own communication. He's actually gaining more of a grip on his own career, on his own business moves, you could say. And so that's very powerful indeed. And so it was in 1998 that Jim would do The Truman Show, one of my personal favourites. I mean, I like all these movies, all pretty cool. And um, we see that that sun's still moving towards Chiron there. And the moon is still in Libra, progressing in the fourth house. Maybe some emotional scenarios going on in this man's personal life at this time. Who's to say? You do not know. And we see that these nodes, are, that Mars is conjunct K2, the south node. He's really just having to let go of who he was. His own identification of who he was is just being let go. A bit like Truman was in this illusion of who he was. Truman was just didn't know that he was in this movie uh, and everybody around him was actors and he had to break free of this construct. Very powerful that we can see that actually the acting role in the chart at this time as well. And so in 1999, Jim would channel a, a famous comedian, Andy Kaufman from Cheers. And he would very much take on this role where he was channeling this famous actor, this famous comedian, Andy Kaufman, uh, in this movie, The Man in the Moon, in 1999. And we can see that actually uh, the sun is conjunct Chiron. So he actually self-sabotaged this movie. He didn't want any publicity done for this movie, any advertising done, and which is very Andy Kaufman kind of movie. So it's truly channeling that energy. Very powerful indeed. Uh, a very funny film as well. Starred with um, Courtney Love and Danny DeVito in that movie. And Mars there, conjunct K2, the self node, a total loss of identity, just like Andy Kaufman. Very interesting, right? Sun conjunct Chiron in the progress chart. A year later, in the year 2000, it was Me, Myself and Irene, another movie about loss of identity. identity. Uh, it's about split personality disorder. Sun conjunct Chiron exactly that year. Wow. Wow. Venus trining Neptune. Illusions. The moon conjunct Neptune. You can't write this stuff, right? You cannot write it. You can see that secondary, uh, secondary progressed ascendant coming to the end of Cancer as well, which is a very emotional position for your ascendant to be, or any planets. Um, we actually have Jupiter and Venus. Um, as I record this, we actually have Mercury retrograde and Venus transiting those degrees as I speak. And so it was in 2001, uh, oh no, actually in 2004, excuse me, that Jim would do Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mind. 
and we see that the, the sun is starting to break free from Chiron. And this was much more of a romantic movie. And we see that the South Node is actually hanging out between Mercury and Mars in the progress chart. And Jupiter's coming into opposition more so with uh, Uranus, which has regressed back to the 27th degree. That's very interesting too. Um, the moon has actually progressed into Capricorn. And so it's actually trining Pluto there. Powerful stuff indeed. Uh, this was a movie about uh, letting go of past lovers, past partnerships. And so that's very interesting. And it was in 2014, just moving a lot forward, jumping forward, that Jim would come back and do Dumber and Dumb and Dumber 2. Something that he put off for many, many a year. And maybe his, his old identity wasn't in this. You see that the progressed descendant was moved into Leo. And Mars is at the 29th degree of Aquarius, where his son was when he made the original Dumb and Dumber. Mars being at the same degree, I'm saying it twice, where his son was when he made the first Dumb and Dumber. You can't argue with the cogs of these times. <laughs> Venus progressed into Mars's sign here as well, into Aries, which is where his MC was when he made that movie, Dumb and Dumber 1. So he was open to doing what he was famous for originally. Um, almost, well, it was exactly 10 years prior. Oh no, it was 20 years gap between Dumb and Dumber 1 and Dumb and Dumber 2. Wow, isn't that mad? And Mercury conjuncts Jupiter there as well. And so he's really taking uh, the, the fame again and really taking a back seat for a few years. He's come back to what he was most famous for, Moon in Taurus in the 10th house. And so that's all I've got to share about this. I think we've already established the power in the knowledge that we share within our secondary progress chart. It's very powerful indeed. And every time we have a new moon in our secondary progress chart, it can be incredibly powerful. I have one more example for you. In my personal experience, I was born on a last quarter waning moon three weeks into a lunar cycle, the moon in Libra and my son in Capricorn, which means that seven years later in my life, when the moon was making a conjunction with my son in the secondary progress chart, my parents got divorced and we moved family home for the first time when I was seven years old. And so we had a new beginning and that was in my fourth house. We had a new moon with the sun and the moon meeting in Capricorn. Very powerful, right? Yes, indeed. And so through the arc of my story, when I was 14, I joined high school. And when the moon was making its opposition to where it started out in the full moon of the progress chart, I, ha I had so many friends and a beautiful girlfriend. Since then, I've been letting go of a lot of these identifications with these scenarios. And I'm actually in the dark lunar phase, the gibbous, it's beyond the gibbous crescent, waning crescent. I'm actually in the dark lunar phase. My secondary progress moon is currently back in Capricorn, indeed. And I'm moving towards a new moon in my secondary progress chart, which takes place in 2021 in Aquarius, where my secondary progress sun currently is. And so, Who's to say what that might bring? I'm prophesizing that I would like to be able to find my home in a new community, maybe help establish opportunities to bring around astrology used with permaculture, agriculture, working within different businesses using astrological advice, helping be able to build homes and have my own home. You know, I'm actually currently still living with my mother. Yes, I am a professional astrologer, 33 this year, living with my mother. However, I will buy her a house. I would love to invest in other people's houses because I have got so much great astrology knowledge to share. If you would like me to help you with your business work with this kind of technique, you can get hold of me at unityaroundthecorner at hotmail.com. The links will be below. You can visit my website. I'm here to service you unity around the corner at hotmail.com we can actually go back and forth 
and have a trade of ideas and you can arrange a consultation with me uh, a mutually beneficial time if you want to visit my website it is unifyingperspectives.net and then who's to say how I can help bring around big changes in this world I know the dynamics of my secondary progress chart I actually have my ascendant which started out in Libra progressed now into Scorpio conjunct Pluto a bit like what Richard Branson's was who's to say what kind of entrepreneurial moves I might be able to bring into the business world, bring into the help of a spiritual community, which is really my ambition. And I've got plenty to share about that. So subscribe to my YouTube channel, Philip Daniel Miles, if you'd like to work with me. I've already expressed how you can do that. Really, really massive thank you to Nadia Shah for allowing so many people to come onto her channel so that they can share their message and so that she can actually seed inspiration within this community it's been very very inspiring for me to be able to connect with people who i admire and so i'm very grateful for this opportunity thank you for sticking with me through this incredibly long video put a lot of energy into it as i said it's the third time i've recorded it because of mercury retrograde but it's certainly a labor of love i love this information i love astrology and i love to share the wealth it offers to us both inwardly for our personal emotional journeys as we get to heal our own story from the inside out we're creating more in the physical world this yin and yang light and dark masculine and feminine of our polarities brings us into wholeness and so unity is the goal as one stand together thank you so much for your time my name is Philip Daniel Miles. I am excited for your feedback in the comments below. Please like and share and subscribe to my channel. Have a fantastic day. Thank you so much. Peace.